Welcome to This Just In, the show bringing you the latest advancements in healthcare, strategy, innovation, and public policy. And now, for the fastest voice in healthcare, here's your host, Justin Barnes. Thank you for tuning in, and welcome to This Just In. I'm your host, Justin Barnes. In these segments, I'll bring you the latest advancements in healthcare, strategy, innovation, and public policy. As always, we're broadcasting from the This Just In studios on the Business Radio X network, as well as the Healthcare Now radio network. For this episode, my 244th episode, we have a special show with CEO and fractional growth officer, as well as fellow podcaster, Dr. Roxy Mooney. Welcome back to the show, Roxy. Hey, Justin. It's so good to be here again. Yeah, we had such a great dialogue that I wanted to certainly have you back. And I think we even realized we'll probably even do a show three and possibly four. We just have a lot uh, a lot in common and a lot of good content. And I think our perspectives on the industry are um, are just unique in nature, but also aligned in a lot of ways because of our experiences, um, you know, uh, intersect in, in several areas, as we heard on that last show and talked about. So on the previous show, we spoke about, you know, launching and growing businesses and, and you know, what to you know, look for in, in the building the business and some best practices. Um, but let's, uh, you know, talk about the strategy around launch and commercialization, because you brought that up uh, when we met during an annual conference. So, you know, tell us your thoughts there. Yeah. So, you know, this is something that I um, I speak a lot about uh, because I don't think enough of us really understand the distinction between launch and commercialization. Mm -hmm. So I hear a lot of people talk about launch and when they think about building a business or bringing a solution to market, they talk about launching it, but they don't really um, understand all of the different um, interplay and connection between those decisions that they're making within that commercialization overall commercialization strategy so the way i describe it is that the there's two major distinctions between launch and commercialization one is the timing of those two phenomenon and the other is the goal so most people think about okay my goal is to launch something i want to bring it to market um, and so my timing of launching it and thinking about it is whenever it's finished and it's ready to go to market and so with that mindset, we end up overlooking a lot of those decisions that we need to make way, way, way before we're ready for launch or even after that. So I say commercialization starts from the time that you even have an idea mm -hmm. of a solution or even from the time that you have a, a, an idea for a business. And it ha and the commercialization process happens well after launch. And the goal of commercialization is going to be, um, you know, maximizing um, the monetization of that business or that idea, whereas the goal of the launch is really to, you know, just maximize me selling something. Yep. And there's so many different implications of that. Yeah, and I, I completely agree. And this it's a great nuance. And um, sometimes the way I integrate that is there's a uh, there's a time and a place. And so even when you're building a company and you, you know, sometimes people make the mistake of, oh, we got to make sure that we're profitable and, you know, 80 percent profitability or 75, whatever your target is, certainly in, a, in like a SaaS business, healthcare SaaS business. Um, but there's times where. 40% profitability or 50% is okay because I'm trying to, we're trying to get launch. I need market share. I'm not worrying about getting e in this wonderful EBITDA numbers quite yet, but people don't understand the nuances there. And they say, well, you know, we, we shouldn't spend on more sales and marketing. We shouldn't spend on growth because we got to get to 80% margins. I'm like, you need to be working about 80% margins, maybe year five, six or seven or eight it really depends on your investors and what your overall goal is. You shouldn't be worrying about EBITDA. Um, and if you, you know, and at least in my world, when you're building a SaaS business, right, EBITDA right, is important, yeah. but yeah, you want to worry about EBITDA at the right time. You need to get the market, you know, you, you know, launching your product market fit, right. You know, pivoting if you need to, but really getting that market share and that revenue up and not necessarily worrying about getting 8% profitability. I think that's pretty, you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think also there's like these little nuances when I talk about the interplay or the connections between those commercialization, 
commercialization decisions that are made. So when I think of commercialization, I think of like, what is my product configuration? What is my, um, the timing of the launch? Um, what, uh, the, the, who am I targeting? All of those different things and how all of those are interrelated versus when I'm thinking of launch, I'm thinking of just being able to like build awareness or create demand for something. Yep. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, for me, that bleeds mm -hmm. into um, market segmentation and it goes back, you know, it goes back to a great, you know, that's a cornerstone of, you know, building a company is you may start off with one or two customer profiles or prospect profiles. But to your point, you got to then think about, well, do, do we expand past that? Do we do five? What's our, you know, messaging for each of those profiles? You might have 10 profiles yeah. and you create specific messaging for all of that and really enhances, you know, uh, your commercialization and, and your efforts there. So. You know, Justin, that's a really great example because I think that in healthcare, we are um, really prone to what you just described. A lot of the innovators, whether they're corporate or whether they are startups, are thinking about like all of the people I could serve and mm -hmm. all of the things I could do for mm -hmm. all of the people, <laughs> right? So true. So true. I'm sure you've experienced that firsthand. Yeah. And, and a lot of times, especially with people that are maybe um, not as experienced in business are thinking that that's a good thing, that I'm going to be able to raise more capital or uh, people are going to think that my business idea is going to be more successful. If I say that, well, we could help, you know, 12 different people across 12 different therapies <laughs> with 12 different configurations and it's like no that has a red flag <laughs> huge red flag yes <laughs> no yeah. so true i mean oh. it's yeah and building persona yeah and building personas but that to that uh, personas when you kind of perfected it so i agree with you even there are so many people that to your point we can serve 12 different you know whatever and like no 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 we got to focus on three let's just knock three out of the park we can build a highly profitable business yeah. off of three and then we can do you know we'll add maybe three more a year later or two years later, but there's so much work that goes into maybe these three or these six. You don't want to do 12. You don't even have, you will came raise enough capital. You can't even hire enough people to do 12, you know, different segments. Right. Um, and the certain, those yeah. investors are not gonna be really weary. So I totally agree with you. Someone comes and say, we, you know, basically we're going to boil the ocean. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not going to do it with my nickel right. either. Right. Um, and, or my team. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Excellent and I think point. that, you know, we know that because we've been in business for so long, but especially when we're talking about these technologists or physician innovators um, yes. that aren't necessarily as business savvy, I think that's where in those conversations are even more important. So I want to talk about something else controversial because we talked about a controversial topic in the last show. I'm going to bring up another one. So my producer's happy again. Um, <laughs> Let's turn it upside down. There you go. So. I have come across in the last six to seven years, um, too many founders of products who create a widget that it, it's a decent widget. It's a good widget, but they have, it's not, it's beyond founder itis because founder itis, I can handle that. I've navigated that my whole life. That's just, uh, my partners are always really strong founders and, and that's always great. It's the people who know mm -hmm. they're smarter than everybody else in the room. They don't think it, they know it. And they know how to do everything because they did this one thing well. They don't understand their boundaries. And what you just said made me think of this. They think they can mm -hmm. do everything. And that's so – no one. I can't do everything. I don't care how good I am at certain things. I'm good at growth. You're good at growth. You know, I am not an – I'm personally not an innovator. I am not the idea person. I can execute anything. Right. And I can do it at scale and I can do it profitably and well. But I cannot – I will not come up with a widget. This is what I kind of did my TED Talk on. How do you, how do I, you know, do what I do and how do I explain what I do? Well, I partner with people. you got a good idea. I can get it to market. I can build it, but I'm not going to, I can't tell you what widget you need to create or how you create your widget. It's not my strength. So I think you would agree with that. Absolutely. And I know this is supposed to be controversial, but you and I won't have, we won't have the tension. We'll exactly. have the tension with the other people out there, right? Correct. So I, I I call, this is kind of a layer of this phenomenon. Um, but I, uh, when I was giving my presentation at Hims, I um, got probably my greatest smiles and laughter around this phenomenon. And I didn't make it up. I'd love to say that mm -hmm. I did, but I didn't. But it's called the hippo. Yeah. The highest paid person's opinion. Yes. And wow, yeah. when you think about the hippos in the room that destroy businesses, that destroy launches and commercialization yeah. and 
it's, oh my goodness. Well, you know, I, because I'm the highest paid person, people don't, uh, in the room, people don't, um, tell me what they're really thinking. They don't, or, or even if they do, my you opinion trumps it. everything yeah, else. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Um, and, and so, I mean, it's just so detrimental to our success. And, and I, and I like to say that if you cannot recognize who the hippo is in your company, mm, you're the hippo. <laughs> it's, you. it's you. That's right. <laughs> Oh, and, I love know, there's that. Been times where, there's been times where I had to go, gosh, Roxy, I think you're acting like a hippo right, right. now. You need to step down. Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, no, that's and I think I totally have to I have to keep an eye on that. I mean, I'm a you know, you and I are both very vocal, hard charging people, a lot of energy. And I certainly do not want to dominate a room. I do not. I want all ideas on the table. I want to flush them out. I want to discuss them transparently with everybody. Everybody has a voice um, and I have to be very careful uh, because, you know, I might be the highest paid person, but I don't, my ideas is not the best idea. I want, I hire really good people and I've been so blessed in my career to have amazing uh, coworkers. Um, and ironically, most of them are female. <laughs> so, and you and I have a good rapport. I have really strong yeah. female cohorts um, that have worked with me for 25 years. Uh, and, it, and it goes over really well. And it's just because um, I think they look for people who pave a path for them uh, in the industry. Because I think a lot of people, to your point, they're either hippos or dominator. You know, they have a very dominant personality. Yeah. Women won't thrive in that environment. But gosh, having a strong, you know, female team or, or you know, half your team female, whatever it is, if you can do that, you're going to bring so much diversity to the conversation. So many ways that my brain doesn't process certain things. Other people do. I might, I think, you know, I might be right brained. I need left brain people on the team as well. So I look at the, for that massive diversity uh, to, to really come up with the great ideas. And I'm sure that you probably assimilate there. Well, and I, I think that's so spot on, especially because even if, you know, like yourself, where you've had multiple successful exits and successful companies, and you've got all this really rich experience to bring to the table, no matter how much success and experience you have, the market is different this mm -hmm. time. Yes, it is. Yes, <laughs> the, it solution, is. the solution is different. The market is different. Generations are different. I mean, and, and just the whole market dynamics are different, market trends. So even if you had eight successes does not mean that you should be making all the decisions now because you've got experience and success because it's just so different. And I think that we need to keep that in mind as we go forward. That is such strong words of wisdom. They've never been spoken on the show before. And I love it because I'm experiencing, <laughs> I've had to experience that and, and just myself and going, I, I may not know. I, I, just because I've done a couple of things well does not mean that I know how this market is evolving or where it's evolving. That's also why I love my radio show because I have really smart people yeah. like you on that also, I say it's free consulting. I get all this great information, all these latest and greatest best practices. I just sit and listen, talk to people. <laughs> it's great. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm too addicted to learning. And, yeah. and so it, having the show is my way of continuing to learn. I call it like my qualitative research. Okay. I'm getting ready. I'm getting to hear everybody's lived experiences and then be able to see those patterns. So yeah, you're right. <laughs> Very cool. So here, you got a great topic that, um, that we discussed, um, off air. What's the difference uh, in front of my eyes? What's the difference between an early mover, a follower, a late entrance, and why does it matter? Yeah, great question. And something that I think is just too often overlooked. I, ha I have yet to hear um, an innovator that I'm talking to articulate market entry um, decisions mm. in, in through that lens. So majority of the time when I say, okay, well, you know, like, well, when are you going to enter the market? When are you going to go to market? <laughs> when the product's done, right? That's the extent of their timing strategy. And so, you know, if you think about um, uh, an early mover, a follower, or somebody that's a late entrant, each one of those market entry or time I mean, strategies has very distinct advantages and disadvantages. And so if you don't, if you, if we don't know what those differences are, then we're not taking advantage of those advantages and we're not kind of protecting ourselves from some of the disadvantages. So a lot of times people will think that if I'm first to market, that that's my winning strategy. 
And in fact, that's often not the case. Um, you know, being first to market is usually very, very expensive. You're um, oftentimes having to fund the creation of a whole new category, um, a whole new idea in the marketplace. And so, um, you know, that would be just an example of one of the disadvantages of being first to market. Of course, being first to market has its inherent advantages too. Um, but being a fast follower could actually be your most ideal strategy. So you might delay things and kind of wait to see. If you really understand your market landscape, you might have someone else enter into the market and really be able to see how people react and respond, have that other company um, make the investment in creating the category, and then being able to understand how the market's responding to it and where is that still that unmet need and now you're a your follower you're a fast follower and you're solving a problem that the first to market person didn't yeah that more words of wisdom and i'm actually experiencing that right now there's a venture that i'm looking at and um a company just raised 70 million dollars for that sector and they had to raise that amount of money because the blue ocean sector it's no one's in this space right now yeah. so we're letting yeah. them kind of and they don't really compete it's just more about they're kind of they're touching some of the fringes, but they're gonna they're educating the market on what this opportunity can be. So let them go raise capital, get heavily diluted at seventy million dollar you know raise, yeah. and uh, and go do that yeah. work. And we're watching very closely in the sidelines. I'm just you know I'm taking the summer off, so I'm not doing anything. I'm just mm -hmm. looking around. But I, to your point yeah. though, I'm letting them do that work, spend that money, and then you know if, if something I want to do later on this year, you know I can be a, to your point a fast follower. Um, and learn from what they've done, capitalize on all that capital, and I can do it in a very capital efficient way. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And even if you're a late entrant, you know, a lot of times we think of, oh my gosh, there's already ten other players in the market space. Um, and and so if you don't realize that that you're not there, then you're you're maybe entering the market as a late entrant, but not taking advantage of those unique opportunities. Um, so I think it's just so important for us to dig deep into all of these nuances because what I've uncovered is it's the understanding and then leverage of those little nuances that actually help you be part of that 5% that succeeds that we talked about in our last episode. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great point. And again, that's goes back to what my experience too is Greenway. I mean, we are, there are a lot of EHRs out there when we did Greenway back in 2002, 2003. And, you know, but mm -hmm. we're, you know, we've built the top seven, we've been, you know, top 10, we're in top seven, top eight right there. And, you know, out of 250, 300. So, and there was, a, there was probably... 40 or 50 at the same time that were around or even more. I don't even know how many in 0203. So you don't have to be to your point, yeah. the first mover, but you got to figure out workflow. You got to figure out how to do it right. And, you know, we had um, a lot, you know, almost a hundred thousand very happy customers. It was awesome. <laughs> right, um, right. Exactly. So, um, <laughs> and for everybody joining us late today, my special guest is Dr. Roxy Mooney. We've done a double episode uh, because she was such a great guest before I decided to have her back and we have a good dialogue. Um, you talked about a, a, a topic, diffusion of innovation. What is that? What do you mean by that? Yeah, I know. I feel like sometimes I'm like just filled with all this academic <laughs> jargon. <laughs> um, but it matters, Justin. It really it matters. It um, so, so the diffusion innovation is is basically, um, if I kind of put it in my own words, it's it's the patterns and kind of the speed at which an idea or product or solution moves through a specific population or audience, right? <clears throat> And so, um, you know, this is kind of another one of those things where a lot of people aren't thinking about this, I mean, aren't familiar with this model and aren't thinking about the implications of their strategy and their decision making based upon this model. And it is, it's, it's proven, it's been around, um, uh, Roger uh, Everett is the one who invented it. It's been around since the 50s and 60s. It's not something that's really new, but it's tried and true. It doesn't matter whether you're in healthcare or not. It doesn't matter what you're bringing it to market. It doesn't matter whether, even if it's an idea, it doesn't even mm -hmm. have to be a product. But every single idea or solution moves through this diffusion of innovation. So what is it? So basically you would take any audience and you would divide them into five different segments or slivers. And it start off, starts off with innovators, early adopters, um, early majority, late majority, and laggards. 
And then there's a specific percentage of every market that's kind of representative of that, a representative of that. So you have two and a half percent of the market that is reflective of innovators. And you've got um, 13 and a half percent that are early adopters. So let me just mm -hmm. kind of wheel back a little bit of the jargon and kind of talk, uh, you know, some practical application. So if you looked at that and you combine the innovators in the early um, adopters, that's 16 percent of the market. Characteristically, those two market segments buy for very, very different reasons. And so your messaging and your branding and your product configuration needs to look very, very different for when you're going after the first 16 percent of the market. So that means that you need to have a different commercialization strategy and that's that's tailored to that target market or that characteristic of that um, audience before you're looking at the rest of the market segment. So a big example um, that I that I um, experience often and I'd love to hear what your perspective is, is that when I'm talking to a lot of innovators that are bringing something to market, they're wasting a lot of time trying to twist the arms of people that really are part more of the laggards or yep. the late majority. And those people are never going to buy no matter what you say or do. So true. And they're spending so much time and so much money kind of where they have like the message and the product misfit with the people that they're, the sales targets that they're going after. What's your experience with that? Oh my gosh, you just nailed it. So you, that was our, I had to learn that the hard way. I wish I had talked to you 20 years ago. You'd made, I would have made more money. Um, yeah. No, so I had to learn that the hard way. Certainly at, well, Relay Health, we um, we came up against that. We had language that was was not tailored to innovators. It was more the general market, the, you know, our target, you know, yeah. our total, you know, addressable market type of strategy. So that one was a little yeah. off. We had to figure that one the hard way. Greenway was the same way. The only thing is we did figure that one out pretty early on going, you know what? We have a the best workflow in an EHR for the ambulatory space at the time. So we focused heavily on for, you know, early adopters, the leaders, leaders of communities, the people who are the academics, people like, you know, they wanted to be out in front. They prided themselves to be innovators and be one of the yeah. smartest doctors in the community. And then those smart doctors know other smart doctors. And so we grew our number one lead generator was referrals in the first for the first five yeah. years, six years of the business, we saved so much money in marketing because we actually had a we we actually had a great product <laughs> and we leveraged um, our referral base. So completely yeah. agree. Um, and even my you know my last company, Cure for You, um, we'd it's a very similar thing is we went after specific market need with specific language and a lot of it was early adopters FQHCs different language for them, but, um, and that was one of our biggest customer bases, but again, we went really for the innovator. So I, you know, I, I totally agree and subscribe to what you talked about of, of diffusion of innovation. So it's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so if you're going after that first 16% of the market, you want to have new, never been done before that type of language, because these people want to leapfrog the competition mm -hmm. and they want to do something that nobody else is doing. If you try to use that same message with more of the mid market or, the, or the laggards, <laughs> yeah, you scare the yeah. crap out of them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so those people need to hear that this is the industry standard. Everyone's doing it. Yep. You can do it too. <laughs> and then to your point, majority of the time, those folks aren't listening to the brands and what they say. They want to hear what their peers have to say. So being able to facilitate that word of mouth marketing between those early buyers and those next set of buyers is, is really important. Excellent. So true. Um, I know we're actually coming up on our um, end of time, but in a minute or so, you you also talked about this this um, topic of co-creation. What is that? Oh gosh, Justin, Justin, in a year and <laughs> one minute, you want me to describe this? Okay, this is a phenomenon that has been happening um, consistently by successful companies in other industries. Mm -hmm. um, so Legos, Starbucks, Procter and Gamble, those are just a couple that come off the top of my head that have been co-creating their solutions with their customers. Mm. And it has been a game changer for their business. Um, Legos is one example that comes to mind where they really reimagined innovation and 
reinvented their entire business. I mean, they were kind of, and to me, this is so important because I think healthcare, we have so many companies that are like status quo, kind of dying on the vine, and they're trying to figure out what is what's next. Lego is, Legos is a great example of being in a similar situation and then using a co-creation strategy with their customers to really be able to create the value, the future value that they were going to deliver um, to, to their audience. And co-creation was the pathway for them to do that. And now Legos is like one of the fastest yeah. growing toy companies. So they went from dying on the vine to being wildly successful. And this is the strategy that they use for that. We'll have to talk more about it in a future episode. Yeah. And I love it because it's actually one of the keys to, to my success, certainly over the past you know 15 years or so. So yeah, let's, let's dive into that because I love that. But I also at a higher level, I do love your experience because you could tell you have academia, but you also can tell that yep. you have great practical knowledge of how business works today. Cause academia sometimes does not. Um, so <laughs> you can, you can, you bring both aspects and it's like, that's why you're successful. And that's why you're a great radio show guest, but also I know you're a great host and I can't wait to, to be on your show here. Um, coming up, but, um, but we are at time. So Roxy, thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Justin. It's been great. A lot of fun. Yeah, and we'll certainly do it again. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Please tune in weekdays at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 11.30 a.m. Pacific. As always, you can track me on Twitter at HIT Advisor and use the hashtag ThisJustinRadio so we can respond to your comments from the show. If you miss any of this episode or want to hear more, all of my shows are posted on Apple iTunes, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Speaker, Google play and tune in. Also, we posted some new content, some of my new speeches here on justinbarnes.com in the coming weeks. So certainly check that out. Thanks everyone and stay safe. 